from the San Francisco Shock, please welcome Matthew Super Delici. I just basically told the boys, I said, hey, listen, just one more, one more map. Let's go. The San Francisco Shock, like a 2019 Overwatch League champion. The San Francisco Shock, your 2020 Overwatch League champions! It goes beyond Overwatch. It's like you can talk about us with like the best esports teams of all time. I think we can take on anyone. So welcome to the next in our specialist community webcast series. This one is Ready Set Resilient Enterprise Cloud. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk today why resilience, performance and availability are really important considerations as any organization thinks about running enterprise applications in the cloud. And there's another aspect that we'll also discuss, and that's experience, you know, which is essentially that feeling that you want your customers to have when they're using your cloud based applications, because that experience directly reflects on you and your company. You know, how many times have you tried to use an application or a, a website and it didn't work or it was slow? How did it make you feel? How did it make you feel about the company whose application or website that it was? The way we show up in front of customers today is most often through an app or a, a website. And increasingly, you're looking at cloud providers to host these for you. Resiliency, performance, and availability are things you have to consider. You still have to architect this in as you build your cloud applications. So how many of you have heard of Overwatch or SF Shock? Well, today we're going to be joined by a professional gamer, and he's going to talk about his expectations when it comes to online gaming and the platforms that he uses. And I'm also going to be joined for a community roundtable later by Jason Benevicic, an independent consultant from Cambridge. Jason? Hi, I'm really excited to be here. It's a lifelong gamer. Um, this is a, going to be a great discussion. Thank you, Jason. And uh, Corinne Bassett, who's a technologist at Veeam. Hi. I consider myself very amateur on the gamer level, and I love um, fighting games, for that matter. Yeah, love the shark. <laughs> Thank you, Corinne. And Sarah, who's been in IT for a number of years and worked in with Scotch whiskey and a number of other areas, but is now a cloud advocate with Microsoft. So, Sarah. Hey, thank you for having me on. I am super excited to talk about technology always, and I'm also excited to hear what it's to be like as a professional gamer from your guests later on as well. That's great. And, and finally, we'll also have a keynote from our Jeff Whitaker, who's focused on NetApp's cloud solutions, and in particular, our first party data services with Microsoft. That's our Azure NetApp files. Jeff. Hey, Matt. Thanks. Appreciate it. Actually, looking forward to hearing uh, what professional gaming is. I mean, as a gamer in my old days, it's, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> That's great, Jeff. So, but first up, you know, our first guest um, started playing the video game Overwatch when it was released in May 2016. He and his friends were soon all addicted to the game and were also highly skilled at it, with them all ranking within the top 500 on the North American leaderboards. In light of their high rankings, they decided to form a team together and started competing in online tournaments. And their accomplishments drew the attention of major organizations, and he was invited to join SF Shock in September 2017 and moved into the SF Shock Gaming House. So welcome, Matthew Super Delisi. Thank you for having me. So Super, I'm going to use that name for uh, for the rest of this because only sure. my mother calls me Matthew. So uh, sure. um, we'll go with that. So let's, let's start with a, an intro. Um, this is going to be new to a lot of people on this webcast. So Tell us a little bit about kind of yourself and, and what it is that you actually do. Yeah, so uh, I'm Matt Super, whatever you want to call me, you go for it. Uh, I'm 20 uh, and yeah, I'm a professional gamer. I um, Basically what I do is I play on a team in a franchise league called the Overwatch League for a game called Overwatch. Uh, and I like to, you know, because I, I like to watch a lot of American football, so I always draw comparisons to that. Um, and basically it's like... A, it would be like the the NFL in a way because, you know, there's a bunch of uh, franchise team owners, um, you know, from many different fields or many different backgrounds, et cetera. And um, each player on the team, you know, we all work together and compete and play in official matches. And then there's uh, there's playoffs at the end of the season and then there's the, the championship, so which we actually won, which is cool. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, it was uh, well done. 
Um, so the last, the, it seems that every time I get invited to do one of these community webcasts, the guest has super in his name. And I'm always kind of looking at that going, wow, who, that's, that's some real confidence to call yourself super. Um, I'm, I'm guessing there's a good reason um, that, that, that the name super came about. I mean, what, how did that happen? Uh, actually, I didn't pick my name. Um, that was, uh, okay. I have to give more credit to my brother there, uh, because a long time ago, like I, I was really like maybe like four or five, like I'm very young. I, I used to watch my brother play this game online, uh, and it was called RuneScape. Um, and I wanted to play, but you know, I was really young at the time. I didn't know how to set up an account. I didn't know a name. I didn't know anything like that. Um, so I just asked them, I was like, Hey, could you maybe help me out and set up an account for me? And he was like, sure. Uh, and then the account he gave me was uh, Super757, and then I never bothered to change my name. Um, and so when I got into, you know, playing online games and such and all that stuff, um, I eventually ended up dropping the numbers, and I just kept I kept Super. See, that, that, how cool is that, that you get to call yourself Super, and you can say that it wasn't you that did it, it was somebody else. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, it's great how things work out, right? <laughs> that's true. So, so how many people are on the team? Uh, as of right now, it is eleven people. And but how many and how many people are actually playing the game at any one time? It's so Overwatch is a six versus six game. Um, but okay. you know we have people on our team who are you know specialists. They do um, you know different roles or play different characters that they excel at. Um, and you know everyone on the team has their own purpose. It's not like people are just you know sitting on the sidelines doing nothing the whole time. You know everyone gets involved. People are always talking to each other about stuff, um, and you know everyone everyone's contribution is important. So you can kind of you can sort of substitute people in for, to play different characters based on kind of how our competition's going and kind right. of, you know, actually make that team and kind of form that team based on who you think the competition's going to be, what their strengths are going to be, what you as a, a group need to achieve, right? Yeah, and plus the game, I mean, the game is changing all the time. Like, there's always constant, you know, balance updates and things that Blizzard, who are the people that make Overwatch, you know, they're always changing things about the game. Um, and then people, you know, they excel better in different, uh, as we call them, metas, which is basically like, um, you know, the most efficient way to play the game and, you know, people perform differently in different metas and, um, you know, sometimes people may hop in, hop out and it's just, you know, it can vary from week to week. So I, I'm really fascinated to, to know, how did you, how did you feel when you suddenly realized this could be something you could actually do competitively? What, 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 what was that feeling like? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, not not just competitively, but like, you know, make it my job, which is, you know, really weird because yeah. I just, you know, I, I've played video games for my whole life, basically. Like, I, I know, I just, I always like playing video games. It's fun. Um, but, you know, I didn't think, and, and like, you know, I I always watch people that were like, you know, uh, streamers or, you know, YouTubers, people who make, you know, who play games and make money and all that stuff. But I never thought that, you know, I would do that because it's just, I never thought of myself like that. I was just, you know, I was just... I always enjoyed consuming the content, um, but I never thought that I would actually be the one making it or doing it. Um, and I don't know. I mean, it still it still feels kind of weird. I can't really put it into words, but um, you know, I'm grateful and it's it's fun and I enjoy doing it. And uh, I hope I can always keep doing it. Well, I, you know, and I guess people kind of watching this who are involved in different industries. I mean, I think that that's always going to be the, the, the sort of the goal for most people. If you can find something that you really, really love, um, then I think that's always that's always a great position to be in. You know, you can make yourself successful at something that you really love doing. Um, and uh, and in your case, you, you know, build a, a career out of it, which is, you know, which is phenomenal. Um, so, you know, this does not go without an awful lot of hard work, right? It doesn't matter what kind of job you're in, what kind of role that you perform. I mean, some people said that I think it was some Malcolm Gladwell said one point to become an expert in something you have to do 10,000 hours. And, you know, I, I think that's been debunked a little bit. But I mean, how much time do you spend practicing? I mean, I want to get a, a sense of what is involved in becoming Ooh. an expert in something. So let me think about this. Overwatch came out, I think it was like May 25th, 23rd, 28th, something like that of 2016 um so it was about four and a half years ago and since then i've probably logged maybe <laughs> I, I mean 
I four thousand hours. I I would have to guess at the wow. least. And you, and you still, I, I mean, I, I know this may be a stupid question. You still enjoy playing the game kind of when you're not competing, right? Is it it's still yeah. fun? Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard to put in those amount of hours into something that you're not enjoying, like to, to like wake up and like force yourself to like sludge through it every day is like really hard and really bad for your mental. Um, and you know, I, I see a lot of people try to do stuff like that where like, Maybe because like they see other people do it and they want to do it, but like they don't really know like what it means to do it. And so like they try to like force themselves to enjoy something or force themselves to, you know, do something that they really don't care about as much as maybe they thought they did. And I just don't think it's possible to have like that, like to have success in anything if you have that kind of mentality where like you just you just don't want to do it. You don't want to look at it, but like you still force yourself to. And I, I just I don't think that can really work out. Yeah, I, th I think it's a really, that's a really kind of smart observation, super. So, uh, so just thinking about the kind of people who are watching this, right? Um, most people kind of watching this, this webcast, they're in the tech sector. So they're, they're kind of building the platforms and technologies that enable games like Overwatch. And do you ever really think about any of that stuff, that, that kind of stuff in the background that, that makes all of this work? Uh, the only time I think about it is when it, hinders me or makes me you know <laughs> not have the same fluid experience that i always like to have so you know if like the you know the server crashes or like you know it's not stable or you know stuff like that only then do i notice what's going on so like you know the not though the one or two percent of the time where things are going wrong is when i notice but then when everything's going fine i'm like okay yeah that's just how it's supposed to be yeah, and, and you know what, and, that, and, that, if that's, and that's a really good point for, for kind of everybody watching this, is when everything's going right, that's just normal. That's just what right. people expect. It's yep. that tiny, tiny little bit of the time where something goes wrong, where we suddenly swing to a completely different emotion. You know, it's like mobile phones. I mean, you know, if you, if you suddenly pick up your mobile phone and, and you know, and, and you can't make a call or you, you can't send a tweet or you can't do something, you know, the frustration we feel is incredible. But when it is working, we just take it for granted, right? Yeah, I mean, because, like, for the most part, like, I mean, it's kind of weird to say because, like, a lot of this stuff was still, like, uh, you know, it was here since I was born, basically. But, like, a lot of this stuff is, like, still new. Like, when you think about it in terms of, like, the overall, you know, I guess history of it. It's still, like, fairly new, all this stuff. Um, but, like, still, like, you know, the things that, you know, we, we can do, with, like you said, on our phones, computers now. I mean, it's it's, it's crazy to think about, honestly. It's, so it's, it kind of comes back to what we said during the intro. It's all about the experience, you know. And right. the reality is you are an end user the experience or the, the, the application that you interact with happens to be a game, but that could be anything. That could be an enterprise application. It's anything now that, that, that people like yourselves interact with. We have this expectation um, and, and those expectations are extremely high. And our level of patience, I think, is becoming less and less and less um, because we just expect yep. these things to work. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, quick question, what's next for the team? So, and, and also, how can people kind of follow the team and, and also get involved with uh, SF Shock? Right. So, as of right now, we are in the off season because we, season ended about two months ago. I think exactly, actually, two months ago, exactly. Um, and we were in Korea for the finals. Um, there was a long process there that we had to do through quarantining and all that stuff, but you know, we went to Korea for the finals, final four, um, and we ended up winning, which was very cool and enjoyable. Um, and then we, you know, kind of like sports off seasons. Um, we, you know, we have our off season we, where we do our own thing, take a break, relax, do whatever. Um, and then sometime, you know, coming up in the next month or two, we're going to regroup together as a team and start practicing for the, for the next season. And we're going to get things rolling. And then, um, you know, I mean, there's, you know, every social media, I mean, basically there's, you know, there's Twitter, there's Instagram, there's all that stuff people could follow uh, for the shock and get all the news about that uh, and me. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, you know, we'll hope to uh, just, you know, do the same thing we did last season and go for the three-peat 
because we actually did win the season before as well, which is extra cool. Um, and we're going to just keep doing our thing. Well, that's great. And, um, you know, good luck with it. And uh, I hope the, the practice goes well. So, you know, th thanks very much for, for kind of this, this initial chat. And please do stick around for the panel session that we've got coming up a little bit later on. So uh, thanks again, Super. Um, Thank so, you. So now let, let's think about what this means to kind of enterprise companies. You know, I think what we were starting to do there was give that, that context that, you know, everything is about an experience to an, an end user, whether that end user happens to be using your enterprise application or whether that end user happens to be working with Overwatch in, in this particular this particular environment. Um, <clears throat> but all of these things have something very, very simple in common, which is that it's all about cloud. The, the cloud is enabling us to do all of these things. So, you know, how do we make sure that as companies take applications into the cloud, that they don't compromise on that experience, that they're thinking about, you know, some of the things that, that we just talked about. So our next speaker is a member of the public cloud services team at NetApp, um, and he's focused on sh making sure everyone knows about all the cool things that we're doing, in particular with Microsoft Azure. Um, some ideas that he's considered, which I found out about, um, but it hasn't invented. Um, he considered machine learning um, and considered virtual reality, and apparently was, was very interested in a drone that would fetch tapas on demand. Um, so on that note, Jeff Whitaker, take it away. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Yes, the, the tapas one is, is key. Um, so anyway, so my name is Jeff Whitaker, as, as, as Matt said, with, uh, with the public cloud uh, services team at NetApp. And really, when we're talking about, you know, some of the things here, when, it's, when, it, when we're talking about running applications or running services that are core to an enterprise environment, you know, the, the correlation here with, you know, as Super had said, is we expect things to operate. Right. We just expect it. And, and from the standpoint of the enterprise side, there's business consequences when things don't operate. So a, a lot of work goes into making sure that those environments are resilient. Right. Make sure that those environments um, are continuously available. You know, you think of, of, uh, of a core business transaction environment that may cost substantial dollars for every minute that it's down. I mean, these are key things to just from an overall perspective. In a gaming world, you know, if if uh, if there's a glitch or there's a hiccup, if there's something, I mean, it could mean uh, that you lose a game, right? Something happened in the background because you had a glitch or your environment had a glitch, and somebody else was able to take advantage of that. Um, in in the in the business world, it's a little bit different, but it all comes around being able to make sure your environments uh, are accessible, available, um, operate cleanly, um, and We've been doing this, you know, or, or uh, enterprises have been doing this for decades, effectively trying to make sure in the data center they had environments to uh, stand up and operate. But now as this, the, the cloud comes into play, there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of capabilities that are associated with the cloud environments, but, but uh, enterprises are moving their environments over, right? So you're looking at, hey, how can I take advantage of what the cloud offers me, but I can't give up resilience, right? I can't. Uh, uh, build an environment that has negative impact on my business operations. So, so what are some of the challenges that happen there? Getting that availability, making sure that your applications are continuously running. A lot of times they're not built into the services that are available to you. You actually have to build that in as you move over. And one of the things that's kind of, you know, the, the cloud is known for is being simple and easy, like a click and click and use or click and operate. So when you have to go and build some of these pieces into it, I mean, there's a, a heavy amount of complexity that can often come into saying, I need to build myself a resilient uh, environment in the cloud. And then also when you start doing those items, what is the impact on your performance, right? If, 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 if the environment slows you down and you're not able to transact or you're not able to run your operations how you may have in the past, you know, it's it maybe a non-starter. So trying to get an environment is, is in, in the cloud, an enterprise resilient environment in the cloud is quite challenging. And, and really there's multiple pieces that come into that compute. People go to the cloud to have all this flexibility, the compute environment that runs their apps, but there's more to it um, when you're talking about the infrastructure side of it. It's, you got compute, you've got storage, you've got the place where your data sits, right? You can't lose your data. You can't lose access to your data. And, uh, and so when you're looking at those environments, 
can you get an environment when you move to the cloud that solves all those pieces for you? And that's where, that's where we come in. That's where NetApp comes in and Microsoft comes in um, with the Azure NetApp file service. And this is a file-based storage service or a shared file storage service that is available now to customers that move into Azure. And one of the big things is, is this is built on uh, 27 years of NetApp history of you know 300,000 plus customers building their data center environments. We've made that technology available through Microsoft um, to you or to anybody that's actually trying to build an environment and get that resilience and get that enterprise need solved. And you know, uh, Microsoft came to us uh, a couple of years ago and said, "Hey, we need a file storage environment in the in the Azure and." Uh, data centers themselves so that customers can solve the challenges with files. But what it did is it brought NetApp technology into the Azure environments and it opened the door. It really opened the door from an enterprise standpoint to get high performance, very high performance, performance of what customers had expected in the data center. Mm -hmm. They were now able to get in the cloud. And then we build our environments in a very resilient fashion, and we were able to expose that up to the service itself. So if you come in and you say, hey, I need storage and I need it to be available, Microsoft guarantees the four nines of availability right up front, which is the highest in the cloud right now. And then we bring a lot of things in that we've built over the, over the uh, years to solve some of the data protection story. You know, what if something happens? You know, what if a, a hurricane hits a data center location? You know, making sure that we have tools at the data layer to allow you to replicate to different locations so that if something does happen, you can help uh, you can solve that challenge by moving to another data center. Really, those different activities that are part of resilience, part of operating. And then we have, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, very high performance so that when you move the applications and you, um, you know, think SAP, think Oracle, think database environments that are often core to your underlying enterprise uh, infrastructure or your enterprise applications, making sure that we can run those extremely fast, very quick response times, database access times are quick, to the point that um, we're the only file storage service, or Azure NetApp Files is the only file storage service certified for use with SAP HANA. And SAP HANA is probably one of the core applications for a lot of large enterprises. And as they're making uh, moves and they're taking advantage of the cloud for flexibility purposes and being able to do updates and upgrades and all this and shift off to different resources, only pay for them when you need them, uh, taking advantage of those from that standpoint, but yet being able to keep that resilience, right? Keep that lower that risk profile, hit the performance that your application needs, you know, is a very big one. So when you bring those in and you bring the additional features that we've built in over the years to help protect data sets against unforeseen uh, activities, it becomes, uh, um, I don't know, almost like a trust thing, right? It's like, hey, I can look at an environment and I feel comfortable based on what's available to me. I feel comfortable from a data standpoint that my data is going to be there. Microsoft's going to back it up. They'll back it up financially if they don't meet some of these requirements. So there's a, a lot of things when we talk about building an enterprise resilient cloud to solve, you know, maybe it's the gaming scenario where that has to operate. I would hate to see uh, some hiccups or something go down in one of these, uh, one of your, your super, your challenge environments or one of your big competing environments. What if everything goes down? You know, there's scenarios that making sure that the infrastructure underneath that is resilient and stays operating to run your gaming side or to even run uh, uh, your environment, your enterprise environment as well. So that's where we come into play. Um, you know, one thing that you want to, you know, not just take my word for it, but you can actually go into Azure right now. If you have a, an Azure account, you can go in, do a quick look for Azure NetApp files, and you can sign up and use it right away. So I, I, would, I would challenge you to go take a look and see what I'm talking about when it comes to solving some of these resilience challenges when you make that move to the cloud. That's great, Jeff. Thanks very much for the update. And uh, so let's bring everybody back in for the community round table. I was gonna interject as well. But, I was, um, yeah, so. No, I was, I, and I think it may be for the same reason because we've chatted about this before, actually, Jason. Um, so <laughs> yeah, there's a bit more of a connection between kind of Azure and Xbox and gaming than maybe maybe people realize. So, you know, tell us more about that. Yeah. So, I mean, 
Microsoft have a long history in building scalable, resilient um, infrastructure. So they started the Xbox Live project in 1999. Um, it launched in 2002. And it's probably one of the world's largest gaming um, online services. And a lot of the learnings and the um, knowledge and foundation of that is what came into building Azure as well. Um, you know, they had experience running worldwide data centers for millions of users, um, and they had experience in scalability. So, you know, what we see in modern Azure mostly comes from a lot of that experience learned in gaming. But also, we also see that game development um, has a huge impact in how we treat distributed computing. The team behind Halo created a set of technologies uh, named Orleans. And Orleans is a distributed um, scheduling and uh, lobbying service, basically, so that everybody could play Halo 5 online. Um, so some, some, some interesting snippets there just to kind of bring these things together. Like, I mean, and people won't always think of gaming and enterprise technology in the, in the same sort of uh, thought process, but uh, th there's a huge link there. And it's actually one of the main reasons I got into IT in the first place. Uh, my love for online gaming um, brought me here to, uh, to, to build the systems that they ran on. Uh, there's, there's always an interesting history behind how we ended up in these positions, isn't there, Jason? Um, but uh, yes. I, I mean, let me come to you first, Sarah, if I, if I could, because it kind of there's a bit of a link there. I mean, you being with with with, with Microsoft, you know, it, have, have you kind of seen some of the, the the things that we're learning, and and you know, and how how's Microsoft kind of evolving to this, you know, this this, this massive move that we're seeing of everybody moving towards the cloud. Oh, yeah. Um, I think um, even just what Jason was saying around running our Xbox platform on there, a lot of the security things and the best practices that we suggest to customers is built on the attacks that we see to the Xbox platform. Um, you know, so we, we are sharing all of that learning with our customers as well. And then thinking to what the pandemic has caused us all to work remotely as well, trying to scale up a lot of our applications, even um, Microsoft Teams lots of people adopted to that and we had to scramble um, to provide that um, kind of capacity for everybody to be able to use Teams and be able to have those remote meetings and still have that productivity has been um, a, a big challenge for us as well internally as well as helping all of our customers adopt some of these platforms as well so yeah it's been a very challenging season for us <laughs> recently as well. Yeah, I was going to say holiday season as well, that lots of new Xboxes coming online at the, all at the same time, I guess. So, uh, you know, and Corinne, I mean, um, you know, you're maybe from a slightly different perspective. I mean, your, your focus is obviously, you know, the data protection. And uh, it's lovely to see so, so many animals with you today, by the way. Um, but from, <laughs> the same so from one. A, <laughs> yeah. How, so, how, I mean, from, from your kind of thoughts, I mean, we're becoming more and more, I mean, data is everything, right? And, and whether it's our, our personal data, whether it's gaming data, I mean, I don't know how Super would feel if suddenly every bit of his data that was related to all the games or the progress that he'd made throughout the game suddenly got lost. Um, I'm guessing probably a little bit upset about it, I would have thought. But uh, so, so kind yeah, of tell us a little bit about sort of Veeam's view on this from, from kind of cloud and, and data availability. So we definitely look more at the backup to make sure if something does compromise the integrity of that data that we have a copy to be able to restore from. Tying it back to games is my computer behind me. I actually use our agents because occasionally the back end game data for even some of Blizzard's games, depending on the update, the profiles may get messed up where I have to do a restoration in order to have my, you know, LVI have the proper uh, game bar. And just small things like that, having a backup of my game data has saved me, I would say hundreds of hours if I had to reconfigure it every time something went amiss. But the integrity of that data is, I think, a huge factor in the resiliency of the data. Knowing that everything's available, but then if something does happen, that 0.0001% of the 99.9% that they protect, it's there. And that's our entire view is making sure you have that data in a way that makes sense to you. Because even if you're able to restore some of the data from backend servers, even in the case of Microsoft, you're not restoring back to the original location with the same, say, permissions and data sets. And we play very close attention, especially in being backup for Microsoft Office 365, 
is making sure we're restoring that data back to the original location with the integrity that you expect the end user to be able to see that data. And that's kind of where we uh, interject into this. Yeah, and and super. Just kind of throwing to you for a second. Again, I don't, I don't know how much you kind of think about all of this stuff. I mean, but th there must be an awful lot of data, whether it's your kind of social media history what, or whatever, that I'm guessing is pretty important to you, right? Yeah, I mean, like, it's you know, in my, in my experience compared to them, is obviously very, uh, I guess, you know, elementary. I don't know as much as them. Cause it's their job um but you know i mean like the, the, like you said like i mean it's i talked about it earlier like the, i mean there's so much stuff that we take for granted that like it's hard to really like understand what it is that that goes on like behind the scenes unless you have like the experience in those areas and stuff um and i mean even like related to you know like you know overwatch like there's i mean there's a lot of stuff that you know if it something goes wrong or something it goes missing i mean you know I'd be upset because I have to redo all that stuff again. Um, but, you know, it's... And it, I'm also kind of surprised to, to see how much of it kind of, like, relates back to... What, you said Xbox Live? Was that what, what it was? Yeah, that was... Yeah, because... Yeah, like, I, I remember I was talking to someone, and uh, a lot of the reasons why he said that he got into, um, you know, like... Uh, I forget what it was exactly. Something with, like, server uh stability or something like that he said he got into because um he was like back in the day when he used to play on xbox uh and people would you know they would always like because like a big problem back in xbox live was people would always uh you know ddos people and he said that he always wanted to know like how that could happen or why that would happen and the reason he got into it was because of that um and so he started learning more about it and now that's what he's you know majoring in in college now which i think is you know it's pretty neat that it all kind of ties back together there yeah, he kind of yeah, pulled, no, so, pulled a thread, and, uh, and that's, <laughs> pulled a thread, and that's where it kind of took him to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so, so Jeff, kind of, you know, you were talking, you know, about kind of what we're doing, and, and you know, kind of the whole Azure NetApp files. I, I mean, you know, give us a little bit more perspective as to, you know, what is that. that what does that kind of mean when it comes to that 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 kind of experience? We we sort of talk about availability. I mean, that's our world, right? Is as technologists, we always think about it's about availability, it's about reliability. But these things, that's not really what other people care about. Other people care about experience, right? So so so, what is it that that, that we're kind of doing? What is it that, that we're focused on? How do we bring about this kind of reliability and availability that creates that positive experience for you know end users like Super? You know, there's, it's interesting as experience, there's so many different angles of this, but it really is how do things kind of operate for you, right? You, you know, we, we had talked about a little bit earlier how if there's a hiccup, right, that's what we remember. That's what we like get focused on. If there's a problem that goes on, you know, all the bells go, go, go off, right? Everybody, you know, freaks about something. But if there's an environment and you have built into how your, your like application infrastructure works, things that work in there so that you can cleanly recover. Um, so you can um, deal with those scenarios or it's like an automatic environment that deals with those scenarios. So there is something, something happens and um, you have mechanisms in place to quickly get back so that, you know, everybody's fears are quelled, you know, those types of scenarios with applications, but also um, from an experience, you know, what's the, the lag time? You know, how many times have we dealt with applications where we go and we click on something and we expect it to come back and it takes a little while, you know, the little spinning wheel kicks on. I mean, there's an experience thing that probably all of us can recognize, but usually there's something under the covers that's happening that is causing that. Maybe it's slower system environment, right? The, the environment needs to be higher performance in order to overcome that spinning wheel or that waiting or you know kind of twiddling your thumbs there as you're as you're waiting for things to happen so there's a there's multiple angles of that and and especially as you as you move into the cloud making sure that the environment that it's built on that most of the application operators or the users themselves don't know about or don't care about they just want it to work and you know how many how many times do we sit there and it's like oh man this application's slow and we may not understand what's happening behind uh, the scenes to make that application slow, but providing the infrastructure, providing the tools, really to help our customers not see those things whenever possible. Data access is quick. Um, 
problems happen and recovery points are automated. You know, there's different things that go on that really make that that uh, that make that game real for the uh, for the application environments or the users. When it comes to lag, I know I'm a notorious. Uh... I'm going to try to click again and then end up clicking the wrong thing when everything does load. So I can imagine how detrimental a lag could be for people like me, especially because then I've done an extra step that I didn't even to do to begin with. Yeah. And I mean, how would so, you react to those lag situations? <laughs> yeah. Recently, um, so Activision Blizzard who, uh, who run Overwatch also run a number of other games and, and within the, I know last few months they launched a new expansion for uh, World of Warcraft, which is one of the ones that I, I play and spend a lot of time in. And expansion time um, and new releases, because we often see this with other titles like Call of Duty, expansion time and new release time is stressful um, for gamers, but I can't imagine how stressful it is for the server engineers and the site reliability engineering teams behind it. Um, you know, on, the, on launch night, I was in a queue for five hours um because there were i think on my server twenty thousand odd people trying to connect in the queue at once and that's probably another hundred thousand or so on the server at the time and you know even with all of the best intentions like scaling to meet those demands is, is a difficult task and the cloud's giving us a lot more of that um but it it also takes um some really clever engineering not just in the in the you know the infrastructure stack but in the software stack as well and i think every year we see slightly better results a slightly better game launch a slightly better expansion or a new system as as technology is increasing and the scalability and the you know the, the availability of infrastructure goes out there each year we're seeing things are getting slightly better um and so you know, hopefully we'll solve the, solve these problems eventually when you've gone you know, 13, 14 million people online at once playing one game. Hopefully we'll solve that eventually and there'll be no problems. And I think that's actually a good point, Jason. We have this technology that can help us scale and build reliability in, but as techies, we are still relatively new to doing it this way. So it is a part of, yes, we have that technology, but the skills have to be built up as well. And we need to learn how to do that and develop our applications and run our infrastructure as well. So I think that's sometimes a, a part of the piece of the jigsaw that people forget. Technology is available, but maybe the skills aren't necessarily there and we need to spend some more time on skilling people up on how to run in the cloud and develop in the cloud as well. Yeah, and that yeah, very and much back to what back Jason to... said. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just real quick, going no, back to what super. Jason said, I, I remember, uh, I forget what game it was that Blizzard launched, I think it was Diablo 3 that was like, it was like deemed like one of the worst launches like of all time, like because on, on release day it was like no one could get in and it was like, it was like impossible and it was so bad and then I remember when Overwatch came out people were making jokes like oh it's going to be the same thing but the Overwatch launch was actually pretty smooth and there wasn't really any problems at all with like the servers going live and people getting in. So, you know, it is getting better. Maybe one day they'll just be, it'll be perfect. Who knows? We'll be telling the younger yeah, generation, maybe... you should be so lucky you didn't have to wait. Yeah, to get yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but I think it goes back to the kind of, the, how long does it take you to become an expert? You know, I think the... the, the we, we sort of take, you almost sort of think that, well, the cloud's just been here kind of forever now. It, it, it hasn't. Hmm. Um, and, and even though the cloud has been here for a while, the actual kind of mass adoption and companies really feeling comfortable to start putting mission critical enterprise applications into the cloud is still a relatively new phenomenon. Um, and, and we are still learning. I mean, when we started looking at SaaS applications, people just assumed stuff was protected. You know, I'm, I'm giving this to someone to, to run for me, therefore it's their problem. They'll take care of everything. They'll manage the data. They'll protect the data. They'll deal with disaster recovery. And it was, ah, they don't. And I, so I, and I think we're still learning this stuff. Is, is that right? Is that kind of what you see as well? Oh, yeah. I think um, from our point of view, lots of customers see those really attractive uptimes, those three nines or four nines, depending on the service, and think, oh, I don't need to think about backup and I don't think need to think up about disaster recovery anymore. And, and unfortunately, 
there can be outages in some of our, their data centers in the cloud. So you do have to think about it. You do need to still think about backup and disaster recovery. It's not just someone else's data center and you don't have to care about anything else other than just putting your stuff there and forgetting about it. <laughs> yeah, and to follow on from that a bit, I think we had a level of complacency in application design because for a long time, infrastructure covered on-premises infrastructure covered the bases that we needed. We had HA, we had DR, we had backup. Um, we had business continuity and things in places, you know, like uh, with our big on-premises systems, we could do things like Metro cluster and, you know, get, you know, continuous uptime. And so we kind of built applications based on what the hardware could give us. What we need to do now in the cloud is we build our applications based on the rules of the cloud. And therefore we need to design those things and develop them in. Um, and, and we're going to keep going back to Blizzard because it's a, a good uh, analogy here. But like they have been running World of Warcraft for over 16 years now. And originally servers were, or realms as they call them, um, were you know a set of individual compute and storage in a data center for that realm. And they were sized accordingly for that. And you had bigger ones and smaller ones and hundreds of realms. Uh, as times have gone on, those realms have merged, technologies have changed. And the concept of a, a game server kind of, is nothing more than a name anymore like you play with people from multiple different realms you play um you know with people across different uh battle groups um, and you can invite and that and, and it's just like as they've developed their software into the new technologies we've learned to you know make a better use case of it and that's what we need to do more of um especially with the cloud and Karen, i'll just come to, to you Sarah's quickly Oh, yeah, I was just going to just loop come. back to Sarah's comment Please. earlier. Uh, one of the biggest parts of my job is helping to educate people who is responsible what, to what portion of the data and infrastructure in a cloud relationship. And I think that understanding of that trust relationship is really what's pushing this next level of adoption, being very clear about those lines and knowing when you need to maybe even tap into a third party backup solution because e-discovery and in-place hold are great solutions for legal proceedings. They're meant to create electronic uh, evidence that you can hand over in a court case. But in the case that you need to recover that data back to the original location or hand it to an end user, the solution line kind of stops there. And I find it very interesting that they have this availability level, but if you do have something like a compromised set of credentials, if anything's altered based on those compromised set of credentials, you've let someone into your section and your responsibility of that infrastructure. And figuring out where those lines are and how you can protect each section of those lines, I think is going to accelerate our trust relationship into the cloud. It's definitely not going away anytime soon. And I'm excited for it getting into containers and that elasticity that comes with making everything as fast as we want it to be. Yeah, so I think, so, so one last thought from me, and because I, I know we're, we're running short of time, um, <clears throat> and it sort of touches a little bit on what Jason said. I think that there's a generation of us who've always designed kind of from the infrastructure up. You know, we, we sort of understand, okay, what are the characteristics that the application requires, the, you know, the, the performance, the, the latency, et cetera, et cetera. But then we look at the infrastructure and we go, right, we need to design this to have this amount of availability and we need to have two locations so that we've got disaster recovery and we need to have a backup in place. It sort of feels with the cloud like we flip things on their head. It's now that it's application driven. So it's a bunch of people who are saying, I'm the application owner. I'm going to a cloud that has a limitless pool of storage and compute resources. Therefore, I will just create my application and off we go. Is, is that maybe where the problem lies, is that we're, we're coming at this from, from two completely different sides, and somehow you, you've got to kind of bring the two together a little bit more? I, I think um, I'll kind of answer a little bit of that, and then we'll see what the rest of the panelists have to say as well. But So for me, it's more we had a realm of we had specialists. We kind of moved towards more generalists and people that covered, you know, you'd have an infrastructure team that covered a bit of everything um, and even some application management. Uh, and, and what we actually are getting back into the realm of is where you need more specialists. Um, you, you need 
you know, not just your application specialists or the developers that develop those applications, but you need cloud specialists or infrastructure specialists. And um, because a developer doesn't think about necessarily um, what it takes to build high availability. Um, that's not the first thing on their mind. And, and you can't know everything. I mean, uh, as much as I'd like to try, and I do try often to try and be that person that knows how to do everything, um, you can't you can't be a specialist in absolutely everything and so i think that's where we're going now it's more about that education and and recognizing that we need specialists working together to to bring those new apps i i think that's exactly the the point that we've got to jason i i was a generalist i did everything i looked after desktops i looked after servers i did a bit of database administration i even dealt sometimes in development but that was embarrassing but um and now i'm having to pull that back and find where my specialist um, area is and define that and i'm looking at cloud infrastructure so trying to focus on that and um, even networking in the cloud is is slightly different the 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 core fundamentals are the same, um, but it's different and it's how it works is different. And we're no longer getting to touch and cable everything else. And we're having to think about um, how to code it and stuff like that as well. So yeah, it's very much that we need to move away from being generalist and look at specializing in something and then figuring out how we all work together and how, how you bring those um, teams of specialists together as well. is also part of the, the culture change that needs to happen as well. I you know, feel I like I said one, the one of the things. I was going to say that I want to be a specialist in everything because you want to have the answers when someone comes to you. And I've done everything from desktop support to networking and security. And then I got into virtualization when I started with Veeam. And then somehow I'm now in software as a service cloud applications. And it's just so big and broad of a field moving from even just a virtual infrastructure to a cloud infrastructure that I've had to dedicate a lot of time and move away from my core knowledges and some of those other sectors and tap into other parts of my team in order to know that we're supporting the entire infrastructure properly. I can't keep up with the infrastructure as a service across three cloud platforms and the software as a service across three cloud platforms at the same time, unfortunately. Yeah, I was going to say one of, one of the thoughts too from the specialist standpoint versus the generalist standpoint is that as the cloud has evolved and some of the early applications, you know, I've been I've been working with the providers for about seven seven eight years now, and watch kind of the evolution of who's working there, and who's building things right. And a lot of times it started off as we're building environments, we're we're doing things, we're building an application from scratch, and that's one thing. But then as they it's like, hey, we can make we can save money or we can we can have more flexibility to build as as an enterprise moves infrastructure, moves environments into the cloud. But as those become business critical components, right? If those become uh, pieces that are being moved in that require you know, it's like, this is a core piece of our business. And just because we're moving to the cloud doesn't mean those key attributes go away. So we start to see more specialists um, going into that. It's like, hey, I need to run my SAP environment. You, you know, I end up talking to a bunch of SAP people, right? Or I talk to Oracle people, you know, people that know those areas instead of generalists, because guess what? You can't have your environment go down. Right. In these environments, it's not a development platform anymore. You know, it's this is core business. So specializing, you know, why one of the one of the reasons we build these platforms is really to come in there and solve some of those challenges for customers. Right. We specialize in storage. And so we want to make sure that we provide that uh, that help, that information, that knowledge to help customers actually make these things move. But it's 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 interesting over the years how the audience has changed because of what's going into the cloud. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd love to keep the discussion going, but we are just out of time already. Um, so, you know, thank you all for uh, for, for kind of joining in. And uh, so I wanted to, to kind of finish off with a, you know, so what, what, what did we learn today? Um, well, you know, I, I guess we learned that um, Corinne has a cat. Um, that was one thing I picked up on. Um, I think um, we we need to, to start thinking more seriously now about becoming specialists. And, and, and I think we all agree that that's difficult because, you know, there's too much for us to, to, to be specialist in. So we need to take a, a different kind of view as we go to the cloud. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that Jeff and his um, drone delivered tapas will happen at some point in the, uh, the near future. 
Um, and I guess for everybody on this call, um, if you're online gaming and a guy called Super turns up in the online game, you are going to lose. So thank you to Corinne, to Sarah, to Jason, to Jeff, and most especially to Super. Um, it's been a pleasure having you all join us for this call, a pleasure to you guys for listening, um, and please do join us again for our next community webcast. Thank you very much.